Thank you very much for coming here today. I'd like to, of course, thank Paul and Hoodie Zhang and uh, Beth for putting this all together. Uh, great to be back at my alma mater. Uh, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one aspect of my current research, which in some ways came out of my encounter with uh, Makino-san, uh, my research on the history of Japanese film theory. Now, uh, way, way back when, when I wrote my dissertation, uh, my dissertation project, uh, which eventually became the book, uh, Visions of Japanese Modernity, was concerned with how cinema was defined, shaped, and arti articulated in its first 30 years in Japan. The argument was that cinema did not simply arrive fully formed. Uh, in Japan in 1896, but was created over time in part by discursive processes. As the often conflicting efforts <clears throat> to describe and understand cinema in various fields ranging from criticism and law to philosophy negotiated and established film's place in a modernizing Japan. Yet obtaining these discourses was not an easy matter for me. Uh, other people have talked about similar problems. Uh, it was not easy, especially when it came to the period before the rise of the medium as a mass phenomenon, a point when the volume of writings on it naturally increased. <clears throat> Libraries often did not have such material, so I relied on a kindly gentleman who offered me access to his collection of rare materials at home, Makino Mamoru. Uh, now, one of the early books he showed me was a work with the curious Japanese title, Shokuhai Bigaku published in 1911 by a man named Nakagawa Shigeaki. Uh, Makino-san, when you talk to him, he will say Nakagawa Jure, uh, <coughs> but at least in the dictionaries, he's Shigeaki. Uh, Makino-san explained that this was the first book in Japan to consider the cinema from the standpoint of philosophical aesthetics. Uh, his copy was rather precious, <coughs> so he wouldn't allow me to do what he did with other texts, as with Joanne, and run down the street and foc photocopy a section at the local kombini. <clears throat> so I sat down and painstakingly copied the one chapter Nakagawa wrote on film. Uh, this may have been rather ironic since I actually eventually learned that Nakagawa's argument was that art involves a creative transformation of reality and that then and thus that such slavish reproductions of reality which is what he actually considered cinema was doing, were not to be considered art. Now, my copying was certainly not creative, though my handwritten kanji were pretty atrocious. Uh, but what I was copying was clearly an important step in establishing the question of film art uh, and thus in defining the medium. <clears throat> Makino-san saw in Nakagawa an issue of cinema that most in Japan had ignored the beginning of a long and complex history of intellectual conceptualization of the motion pictures. Now, although Makino-san also de devoted considerable energy to the study of documentary and censorship, one of his main concerns was the history of film theory. He wrote about a number of crucial figures who wrote on film, ranging from the psychologist Hadano Kanji to the poet Sugiyama Heiichi, but he particularly focused on what he named the Kyoto Ega Gakuha, uh, the kind of Kyoto school of film. After the Kyoto Gakuha, uh, the philosophers who congregated around Nishida Kitaro at Kyoto University. Now, while many imagine Kyoto as the repository of traditional Japanese culture, it was also a center for film production and a major site for theorizing cinema and its relation to modernity. Makino includes in the Ega Gakuha such important minds as Nakai Masakazu, Tanikawa Tetsuzo, who's the father of Tanikawa Shuntaro, the poet, uh, Shimizu Hikaru, uh, Kono Yukichi, and Nagai Michitaro. Uh, mostly active in Kyoto, Nakagawa figures for Makino as the start of this long connection between Kyoto and film theory. In a symposium honoring Makino-san and his collection, I thought it very appropriate to consider the work of Nakagawa Shigeaki and the issues they pose for the history of Japanese film theory. Now, I was attempting to narrate a history of Japanese film theory by locating its roots in pre-modern Japanese aesthetics. But just as the cinematic apparatus came to be defined discursively over time in relation to transformations in modernity, so film theory was subject to complex negotiation between foreign and domestic discourses that both reflected and attempted to negotiate with the modern. <clears throat> 
if film theory had a relationship with aesthetics, it was primarily with European philosophical aesthetics. Nakagawa Shigiaki was an early nexus of this relationship since he was one of the central figures introducing German aesthetics to uh, Japan in the late Meiji era. And it was in particular his interest in the work of Konrad Lange uh, that led him to pursue the question of whether film was an art. Lange's conclusion that it was not an art uh, long made him the object of disapprobation by later film theorists wishing to distance themselves from his ideas. Nakagawa agreed with Lange, but the peculiarities of his situation and his thinking, I contend, actually reveal much about the dominant ways cinema would be philosoph philosophized uh, in sub subsequent decades in Japan. Now, born in 1850 uh, as the son of a samurai, Nakagawa was a somewhat typical Meiji man, mixing ambition with a Renaissance perspective and a dedication to improving Japan. He learned poetry from Masaoka Shiki and founded Kyoto's most influential poetry journal, Kake Aoi. Uh, his pen name as a poet was, in fact, Nakagawa Shimei. <clears throat> now, around 1890, he began translating works by German aestheticians, uh, eventually earning a teaching position at a new art college in Kyoto. His greatest contributions to aesthetics were his two books, uh, Aesthetics of Haikai and Aesthetics of Detached Contact, uh, Shokuhai Bigaku, what I just mentioned earlier, uh, both of which were primarily devoted to explaining the allure of Haikai or Haiku poetry through Western aesthetics. Now, in the end, Nakagawa exhibited an, a not atypical relationship to Western philosophy. His focus on haikai could be aligned with Okokura Tenshin's call for return to Japanese arts. Yet, aesthetics of haikai begin with his declaration that, it, uh, that his is, quote, a form of aesthetics that uses haiku as an illustration, unquote. Nakagawa thus treads the fine line between using haiku to explain Western aesthetics and utilizing European philosophy to clarify the principles of Japanese poetry. Yet, as Kaneda Tomio describes it, this ultimately manifests a, quote, tendency to approach all forms of Japanese art from the point of view of European aesthetics and regard them as objects of aesthetic speculation, unquote. Japanese works are thus being valorized, and foreign aesthetic principles themselves thereby rooted in concrete domestic examples, but is still the Western gaze and its own notion of contemplative distance that defines Japanese art as art. <clears throat> Nakagawa was concerned about this foreign gaze, however, and wrote articles introducing the often mistaken views of Japan evident in the Japonisme fashionable in Europe at the time. Yet he was never the agitator Okakura was. Uh, he could be upset about the obtuseness of Mori Ogai's translation of Edward von Hartmann, and thus proudly gave aesthetics of haikai the subtitle, quote, in plain and popular words, unquote. But that reflected less his resistance to the activization of aesthetics that would eventually render his own eccentric contributions outmoded than his dedication to the Meiji Enlightenment spirit. <coughs> uh, if his basic aim was to, quote, unify European aesthetics and traditional Japanese thought, unquote. It was to a certain extent because of his background in the natural sciences and his major belief in the universality of both science, in part as a means for Japan to catch up with the West, and <coughs> aesthetics, which to Nakagawa uh, should always in some measure be a scientific discipline. Now it was Nakagawa's character as a Renaissance man that made him open to new phenomena. Uh, it has been said that he had a, quote, modern sensibility that understood the avant-garde, unquote. Now, Makino-san himself, in his research on Nakagawa, has argued that uh, Matsumoto Matataro, who was actually one of the pioneers of experimental psychology in Japan, and also uh, the dean of the art college uh, where Nakagawa worked, that he was an important stimulus or influence on Nakagawa, introducing some of these new things that Nakagawa would then go on and pursue. So it should not be surprising that, uh, that in the aesthetics of detached contact, uh, he took up the issue of the motion pictures. Uh, Nakagawa's approach to the medium, however, was not that new itself. In fact, uh, much of the section reads practically like a translation of a similar section in, on cinema in the second edition of Conrad Lange's The Nature of Art. <clears throat> Such liberal borrowings were not uncommon in the Meiji intellectual world, and Nakagawa's 
uh, in particular, unfortunately, uh, presages the degree to which uh, later Japanese film theory would depend on foreign writing. But just as with this later thinking, one should not merely dismiss Nakagawa as a mere imitator. In the process of him adopting Langa, one can see aspects of selection, embellishment, and negotiation that communicate much about the beginnings of Japanese film theory. Now, what Nakagawa found most attractive in Langa was his aesthetics of illusion. Illusion, I should say. Uh, in particular, the notion that artistic illusion is conscious illusion. The <clears throat> impression a viewer has that a work is similar to something in reality, while always remaining conscious that it is not the reality itself. That duality and the corresponding gap between the work and reality allows for the intervention of both the creative artistic subject, who does not slavishly uh, imitate reality, and the active spectator, who must work to connect the illusion to real phenomena. The illusion is not a result of deception, but of individual artistic creation that does not fool, but rather prompts the viewer to imagine what is not there. What uniquely interests Nakagawa about this is less the problem of mimesis than the conundrum of contradiction, <clears throat> how to entertain an illusion without ever really believing it. It is this sort of contradiction that allowed Nakagawa first to align Langa uh, with the concept uh, of shokuhai, uh, detached contact, which comes from a Zen koan that calls for simul simultaneously grasping and turning away from words and reality. Second, he thought Langa picked up uh, or linked up with another principle uh, proposed by Matsuo Basho, that lines in poetry <coughs> should be neither too closely connected nor too detached. In other words, neither separate nor attached. In Japanese, furi fusoku. These two concepts, shokuhai and furi fusoku, became the central terms in Nakagawa's aesthetics. And so his attempts to introduce Langa's philosophy were shaped by his understanding of Eastern philosophy and poetry. As a result, he strays from Langa, whose focus on the consciousness of artistic perception does not necessarily relate to such issues as the connectedness of lines of poetry. <clears throat> a psychological issue has been rendered spatial or, to a certain degree, a concern of logic. Nakagawa further interprets Langa by repeatedly quoting poetry from the masters in the midst of the discussion, finding haiku that, in one way or another, illustrate, explicate, or wryly comment on the points being made. One can interpret these tactics as Nakagawa's efforts to domesticate or Japanize Langa through rooting him in tradition. Now, this vision of Japanese culture enveloping and absorbing Langa, however, should be tempered by a consideration of how much Langa's voice not only remains loud in Nakagawa, but will remain a significant presence in Japanese film theory for decades to come, even as Nakagawa himself was largely forgotten. Langa's conclusion, and Nakagawa's as well, is that cinema and other photographic media uh, is not an art because it is too close to reality. Its illusion of motion is not conscious its relation to reality too close. While later thinkers would dispute Langa's conclusion about the film's artistic credentials, they would not question his criteria concerning what art is. If there is a uh, difference in Nakagawa, it is subtle. Uh, like Langa, he starts with the particular inadequacy of motion pictures. Quote, in contrast to the stereoscope, the moving pictures move in the way reality does but lack the spatial dimensions of the sort found in reality. When we look at the continuous pictures projected in front of our eyes, appearing and disappearing, our senses may be fooled and con unconsciously recognize motion, but one cannot avoid the contradiction here. Simply put, the images are flat and not three-dimensional." This inadequacy could conceivably be to cinema's artistic benefit, because it separates from reality and encourages the spectator to work around this lack. This, in fact, is how the German theorist Rudolf Arnheim justified film as art in the 1920s and 1930s. <coughs> Cinema's flatness, lack of color and sound, and other perceptual peculiarities prompted it to become an art as creative filmmakers took advantage of or invented original ways to work around these lacks. And audiences consciously enjoyed such invention. Langa and Nakagawa, however, felt those inadequacies were too great to enable film to become an art. To Nakagawa, quote, 
uh, the pictures betray themselves in this way, revealing the feet under the horse costume, despite the perception that the images are moving. Because of this, our illusion plays itself out on one side, but cannot fully play itself out on the other. It cannot avoid limping along, just appearing freakish." Unquote. These were thus only negative deficiencies, ones that failed to promote creation, or even actively discouraged it. Far from being a conscious illusion, cinema was not even a very good illusion. Uh, the second problem for Lange and Nakagawa is that such unproductive in inadequacies cannot even be rendered productive by following and improving on the essence of the medium. Both thought it logical that sound and color would become part of the medium, and thus, like André Bazin, that film would naturally move closer to reality. And this is a long quote. Uh, if it goes that far, the only factors that may prevent illusion are the method of dispatching the pictures and the projection of images on a screen. In that case, one can have even less hope of, of achieving an impression of art. Uh, is that not because? although the pictures appearing and disappearing before our eyes may have come that much closer to the reality than the photographs, they have thus become like reflections in the mirror. If they are not, they may have the benefit, as with looking through binoculars, of creating the sense of seeing and hearing things up close. They can become the essential tool of the historian, conveying historical events to later generations as they occurred. But even if they benefit us by creating a sense of familiarity, one where we seem to really witness the events, there is absolutely nothing gained in terms of the enjoyment of artistic taste. The individuality that is characteristic of art fails to surface, and there is no trace at all of creation in these works. One can only stare and wonder at the mechanical invention and the entertainment of reason. The more it progresses, the more its non-artistic illusion grows." Unquote. To Nakagawa, cinema is thus damned, both in its current incarnation and its teleological outcome. The basis of artistic illusion uh, must not be a simple difference between the work and reality. The difference itself must enable or be the product of artistic play. The feat revealed under the horse costume is just an error, a deformation, not an artistic play of deficiencies. If the feet were hidden, the illusion would have been more artistic, but only if it was based on the simultaneous knowledge that there are people inside the costume. Uh, cinema just freakishly offers mechanical unconscious illusion, combined with obvious inartistic inadequacy. Real art, as with sculpture, often involves a conscious choice to remain inadequate to reality. Nakagawa again resorts to a poem to illustrate this point about what art should be. This coming from Tan Taigi. Uh, uh, the no play said not a word, the prayers of Mibu. In Japanese, kyōgen wa namu tomo iwazu mibu nembutsu. Now the reference is to, of the poem is to the fi famous silent no plays performed in Mibu Kyoto every April, called the Mibu Nembutsu. Uh, this can be Nakagawa's citation of an artistic form that makes better use of silence than cinema does, which to him seems like a medium that should have sound but does not. Uh, but the style of the poem is as important as its content. It delightfully combines a word play, uh, namu tomo iwazu can mean both said a word and said not a prayer, uh, with a literalization of the name of the plays. Uh, Nembutsu by itself can actually means prayers to the Buddha. Nakagawa thus seemingly not only envisions the contradiction of a prayer that utters no prayer, which is different from a crowd scene in a film that simply lacks sound, he revels in the double meanings and multiple associations that grow out of this conundrum. As Komatsu Hiroshi has underlined, the later Langa uh, was not as negative about these cinema's artistic possibilities as he and Nakagawa originally were. Perhaps Nakagawa could have changed too, especially if he had the benefit of viewing the more complex films that Langa later did, uh, but they did not yet exist in 1911. Nakagawa himself passed away in 1917. Uh, yet like even the later Langa, he still seems to place emphasis on what are conceived as fundamental aspects of the apparatus, ones that cannot be overcome by either pragmatic application of the medium or audience reception. 
In this regard, Nakagawa sets the precedent for the essentialism that would reign over much later Japanese film theory. But like much subsequent theory as well, an anxious and anxiety over reception lays behind this emphasis on the apparatus. Note that, uh, that Nakagawa also places ikiningyo, or the living dolls made of paper mache, that were popular at fairgrounds during the Meiji era, uh, among the forms that he does not consider art. As Kinoshita Naoyuki has argued, fairground or temple fair entertainments like ikiningyo, called misemono as a whole in Japanese, in Japanese, were important in the introduction of Western realism into Japan. Ikiningyo, for instance, were not only skillfully created, uh, but also presented in a carefully managed space where the light and the viewer's perspective were arranged to prompt the illusion that the dolls were alive. Nakagawa complained of such efforts, such as the choice to give realistic color to the ikiningyo, a choice he underlines that artistic sculptors refuse. He seems most disturbed about the practice of placing the dolls in a space not clearly framed by a pedestal, but rather, quote, on the same level as the viewing audience on everyday tatami mats, as if they were part of mundane reality. It is this choice to promote, if not force, the impression of reality, to make the viewers forget that they were just viewing an inanimate object that disturbed Nakagawa. Such efforts place Ikiningyo on the same in the same category of non-art as the motion pictures. The fact that the two, uh, even though one depends on crafty manipulations of paper and light, and the other on mechanical devices and emulsions, are both seen as too close to reality, indicates that Nakagawa is echoing the dominant discourse of the day first, uh, which up until the 1910s saw the cinema not as a separate medium, but actually as part of the larger rubric of mise mono. By that time, audiences were already being shown uh, in movie theaters, scenes from kabuki plays complete with kabuki music and benshi imitating actors' voices. That is, as an illusion of a kabuki play in a manner similar to in ikiningyo illusions. Now, the case of ikiningyo, however, shows that the problem of excess reality is not simply a matter of mechanical manipulation, but also involves the viewer, whose gaze is part of the apparatus that makes the doll seem alive. Ikiningyo as a medium that crucially depends on the audience, uh, or is a medium that crucially depends on the audience to complete its illusion of reality. Yet in determining that such misemono are not art, Nakagawa appears to presume that the audience somehow loses full consciousness that paper, uh, paper mache and the case of other misemono bamboo uh, figures were not living beings. Uh, Nakagawa could not conceive of film spectators then as consciously and actively working with the difference between a flat black and white image on screen and a three-dimensional colorful reality. In other words, he could not see misemono or film audiences as enjoying the playful artistry of, on their own, making one thing, one thing seem like something it is not, of taking pleasure in consciously being part of the transformation. Art to Nakagawa is a conscious illusion created by the artist one that shuns trickery, even if such tricks are accompanied by a willing suspension of disbelief or a conscious appreciation of the trick. One gets the sense that his distinction between arts and non-arts is not merely a matter of their different apparatuses and practices, but also his conception of class and spectatorship. Who is better able to consciously and intellectually entertain an artistic illusion, or who has the class uh, not to desire a deceptive illusion of reality. In reality, these differences may actually involve differences in taste and culture that reflect social and class conflicts in, in a modernizing Japan. Nakagawa's reaction to cinema and mise mono, if not also his promotion of the field of aesthetics, was a means of promoting one culture in a struggle with other viable cultures at the time, one that ties one that tries to bridge scientific modernism with traditional poetry while remaining wary of lower class cultures. Already with his work, film theory, as well as film practice, participates in a field of conflict over class and culture. Now if we then, albeit problematically, uh, begin the history of Japanese film theory with Nakagawa Shigeaki, it is a history colored from the start by apprehensions about film that are tied to worries about class and culture. Nakagawa, however, is a figure who reveals, if not revels in, contradictions in this endeavor. Uh, 
as he entertains the realism of cinema but rejects its excess reality, as he foregrounds illusion but downplays trickery, as he focuses on apparatus but worries about reception. His focus on contradiction is intriguing and makes us wonder whether there might be a cinema that is furifusoku, attached and detached, as a Zen koan, where shots are edited so that they are neither too linked nor too separate. One can ask whether this vision is, in fact, not really modernist, while at the same time still finding links with the Japanese past. Nakagawa, in fact, provides an avenue for later figures like uh, Inagaki Taroho, the novelist uh, uh, who was one of the few to continue writing on film through Nakagawa's concept of shokuhai bigaku, uh, detached contact, to essentially es criticize the development of the invisible techniques of classical Hollywood cinema. In the end, one can wonder whether Nakagawa himself is not a case of furifusoku, as he treads the line between following European aesthetics and interpreting it through the Japanese poetry he knew, as he embraces contradictions, but still attempts to move them towards a particular cultural outcome. It's perhaps that aspect that makes Nakagawa both unique within the history of Japanese film theory and an important precursor to those who followed him the Kyoto Eiga Gakura, and perhaps Makino Mamoru himself. Thank you.